Take a close look at this face. The furrowed brow, the hand to the forehead, the mingled look of confusion and anxiety, the unmistakable signs of a student trying to study the brachial plexus. There are few topics as challenging to anatomy students as the brachial plexus, which just happens to be the next stop in our journey into the upper limb. Brace yourselves. Welcome back. In the last session, we discussed the vascular components of the axillary space. We now turn our attention to the neural components, which means an in-depth discussion of the brachial plexus. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 It's okay. You're going to be just fine. The neck and axilla are dominated by the brachial plexus and its branches. Plexus is a Latin term for braid, which is an accurate description of the nerve complex. It's a collection of nerve branches stemming from six separate cord levels that fuse, split, and fuse and split yet again. At first glance, the complex appears to be a bit daunting, but with practice and commitment can be mastered. Note that there is a special kinesthetic learning exercise dedicated entirely to the topic. Even if you're not a particular fan of the KLEs, I strongly recommend you give this one a try. It really is the best way to learn the brachial plexus. The main objective of this session will be to learn how to draw out the brachial plexus from memory and properly name each of the branches and the structures that it supplies. For the podcast, we'll start by looking at the structure of the plexus itself, then add the individual nerve branches at the end. The main structure can be divided into five sequential segments based on where the fusions and divisions occur. Roots fuse to form trunks, which split into divisions, which again fuse into cords, which divide one final time into terminal branches. Once again, mnemonics come in handy, helping us to remember the sequential order. In this case, real Texans drink cold beer, or at least so I've been told. I don't think I've ever really met a true Texan. We start by looking at the roots of the brachial plexus, an unfortunate nomenclature when you think about it. We heard the term roots used before related to the ventral and dorsal extensions from the spinal cord. Now, this is something entirely different. These are actually a collection of ventral rami which probably adds further to the confusion, seeing, as, as I previously explained, ramus means branch. So in this situation, the term root was probably adopted to describe the base of the brachial plexus. But again, don't get this confused with spinal nerve roots off the spinal cord. Okay, so the roots of the brachial plexus are made up of the ventral rami off of spinal nerves C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. We'll probably need to wait until unit 3 before we get a really good view of these structures as they are embedded deep in the neck musculature. What we should be able to see is the fusion of the plexus roots to form the trunks of the brachial plexus. Specifically, the root of C5 fuses with that of C6 to form the superior trunk, and the root of C8 fuses with T1 to form the inferior trunk. C7 continues along uninterrupted, but is now called the middle trunk, where it lies between the other two trunks. In the next segment of the plexus, each trunk splits to generate an anterior and posterior division. So we now have an anterior superior, anterior middle, and anterior inferior division as well as a posterior superior, posterior middle, and posterior inferior division. Not much happens at the division level, other than to lead into the next fusion event. This leads into the cords. In addition to the fusion that occurs in this region, the cords are further distinguished by their approximation to the axillary artery, which provides the basis for each of their names. First, let's consider the anterior divisions. Notice what is happening. The superior and middle divisions fuse to form the lateral cord, so named for its location lateral to the axillary artery. There's actually no fusion in the anterior inferior division, but as we saw in the middle trunk, there is still a name change to complement the lateral cord. Here we have the medial cord, based on its location medial to the axillary artery. Next, we turn our attention to the posterior divisions. Pretty straightforward, actually. All three divisions fuse to form the posterior cord, deep to the axillary artery. 
Finally, we have our split into the terminal branches, which actually constitute the major nerve supply to the upper limb. From the deltoid down, there isn't a single muscle that is not innervated by one of these five terminal branches. We can also use our mapping of the brachial plexus to predict the specific spinal cord levels that contribute to each of these nerve branches. This can be done by seeing which nerve levels each of our terminal branches lie downstream from. It's not always 100% accurate, but close enough to make it a useful tool, once the exceptions are understood. Also note that the terminal branches appearing in front of the axillary artery tend to resemble the letter M in appearance. With variation in the fusion and splitting pattern, some M's look better than others. So when trying to locate the brachial plexus, it's often helpful to employ the same strategy used when trying to find cheap takeout food. You look for the golden arches. Probably the easiest to first identify is the musculocutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve can be traced directly back to spinal nerves C5, 6, and 7, all of which contribute to this nerve branch. This is the lateralmost branch off the lateral cord, which penetrates the coracobrachialis muscle to enter the anterior compartment of the arm. From there, the nerve splits into two distinct branches, which gives the nerve its characteristic name. The muscular branch innervates all three muscles of the anterior compartment. The cutaneous branch continues into the forearm to supply the skin of the lateral side of the arm. Identification of the muscular cutaneous nerve allows us to locate the other division of the lateral cord, which fuses with the division of the medial cord to form the median nerve. As the median nerve receives contributions from both medial and lateral cords, it can be traced back to all five spinal nerves contributing to the brachial plexus. In reality, however, the contribution from C5 is variable. As we will learn in later lessons, this branch provides the majority of innervation to the anterior compartment of the hand, as well as some of the innervation to intrinsic muscles of the hand. It's also responsible for cutaneous innervation over the lateral aspect of the hand. The second division of the medial cord feeds the ulnar nerve. As the ulnar nerve can be traced back to the lateral cord of the brachial plexus, formed from C8 and T1, it receives its innervation from these two specific root levels, although C7 can sometimes also contribute. The ulnar nerve innervates two muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm and the majority of intrinsic muscles of the hand. It's also responsible for cutaneous innervation over the medial aspect of the hand. The posterior cord provides two terminal branches. The smaller of these is the axillary nerve. Although the axillary nerve can be connected back to all five root levels, it actually only contains components tracing to the C5 and C6 spinal nerves. As we have discussed, the axillary nerve passes through the quadrangular space to innervate teres minor and the deltoid muscle. The larger of the two branches is the radial nerve, which is supplied by spinal nerves C5 through T1. It courses through the posterior compartment of both the arm and forearm, where it exclusively supplies the innervations to all muscles in both compartments. In addition to the terminal branches, a number of additional smaller branches are found coming off the root trunks and cords of the brachial plexus. Starting back at the roots of the brachial plexus, we observe the dorsal scapular nerve branching from the C5 root level. From here, the nerve travels posteriorly, running between the vertebral column and medial border of the scapula to supply the levator scapulae and rhomboids muscles. The other nerve branch to come off the root level is the long thoracic nerve. It receives branches from C5, 6, and 7 before coursing along the lateral aspect of the thorax to supply the serratus anterior. Two branches are identified projecting from the superior trunk. The first is the suprascapular nerve, which we discussed previously in conjunction with the shoulder region. The suprascapular nerve projects laterally to the superior border of the scapula, along with the suprascapular artery discussed earlier. Here, it passes inferior to the transverse scapular ligament to supply the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. The second nerve off the superior trunk is the nerve to subclavius, which supplies the, well, you know. As expected from their branching off the superior trunk, both nerves are formed from contributions from both the C5 and C6 spinal nerves. The next branches are found coming off at the level of the cords. Off the lateral cord is the lateral pectoral nerve, receiving the anticipated contributions from C5, 6, and 7 spinal nerves. 
Its counterpart off the medial cord is the medial pectoral nerve, receiving contributions from C8 and T1 spinal nerves. Both nerves supply the pectoralis major muscle, with the medial pectoral nerve supplying the pectoralis minor muscle as well. A trick for remembering this additional role for the medial pectoral nerve is to think medial does more, lateral does less. Two additional branches seen coming off the medial cord are the medial brachial and antebrachial cutaneous nerves. These supply cutaneous innervation to the medial aspect of the arm and the forearm, respectively. Note that while the antebrachial branch follows the downstream rule and receives contributions from both C8 and T1, the brachial branch does not generally contain a contribution from C8, as would be expected. Three final branches are found to stem from the posterior cord. The upper and lower subscapular nerves branch out to the subscapular fossa, where they both supply the subscapularis muscle, and the lower subscapular nerve specifically supplies the teres major muscle. Although both can be traced back to all five spinal nerves, in reality, only C5 and C6 contribute to these specific nerves. Typically found beneath the upper and lower subscapular nerves is the thoracodorsal nerve. This nerve projects inferior to reach and supply innervation to the latissimus dorsi muscle. Once again, although this nerve branch can be traced directly back to all five spinal nerves, only the sixth, seventh, and eighth cervical spinal nerves actually contribute to the thoracodorsal nerve. This concludes this lesson on the brachial plexus. Brutal, I know. But the more practice you get with it, the easier it will get. In the next session, we will consider the brachium, or arm, look at its muscular compartments and the neurovascular components of this region. We'll also have an in-depth look at the elbow, which is the principal joint that the brachial muscles act upon. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.